Hello, everyone. I am Riganka Singh. I am a geriatrician here at CMC. And I welcome you all to the 2019 biannual Goodman Kahan Lecture Series in Geriatrics. I thank Ms. Florence Goodman, who is here with us today, um, for her generous contribution, which has made this invited lecture series possible. And today, for our guest speaker, we have Dr. Daniel Mendelssohn, uh, who is the Konar Family Professor of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine in the Division of Geriatrics and Aging at University of Rochester. He's also the Associate Chief of Medicine and Co-Director of the Geriatric Fracture Center at Highland Hospital. He is internationally recognized for developing collaborative management programs for geriatric patients who present to the hospital with fractures and is also widely published in that area. Dr. Mendelssohn received his MS in biophysics and completed MD, underwent internal medicine residency and geriatrics fellowship training at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. He then joined Highland Hospital to develop the inpatient acute geriatrics service and also later established the palliative care consult service. Dr. Mendelssohn is now the lead medical director for the American Geriatric Society's Co-Care Ortho. It's a program which is supported by the John A. Hartford Foundation grant, um, and it aims to disseminate the co-management model of care across the country. This model of care integrates geriatrics, orthopedics, nursing, physical therapy, and anesthesia care to optimize patient and system-centered outcomes. He also serves on the AGS Quality and Performance Measures Committee and the Nominating Committee. So without further ado, I welcome Dr. Mendelssohn and look forward to his presentation on the Geriatric Fracture Center. That's an awful lot to live up to. That's, uh, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, I was just telling Dr. Salata and Ms. Goodman, um, I, you know, I have a very deep connection to university hospitals. My first uh, assignment as a geriatrician at Highland Hospital was to redevelop our acute care for elders unit. All that literature came from here and uh, was very important in my formative years of figuring out what I wanted to do with my life uh, to have access to that. So very happy to be here. Um, the only disclosure I have is I'm uh, the uh, lead medical director for AGS CoCare Ortho, which is funded by the John A. Hartford Foundation. So our objectives this morning, um, I, or this afternoon, I want to help you to understand what I mean by co-management and true interdisciplinary care. I think it's very important to get on the same page because what people think of co-management across the literature isn't always the same. And then we're going to differentiate between craft production, mass production, and lean production, which are business models which we use to develop the Fracture Center, and I think are good models to think about how do we do performance improvement across a health system. And then um, I hope I convince you by the end of this that geriatrics co-management is a value-added service, that this is something where we can bring a lot of additional value to things that we're doing in the hospital anyway. So I'd love to start off with this quote from Einstein. Insanity is defined as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And what I mean by that is uh, if you don't make a change, you really can't expect anything different to happen. And another way to think about that is you really can't expect better for yourself when you're an older adult than what you're willing to do today. Um, so think about the type of care you want when you're frail and uh, make sure that you're working and designing on systems that, uh, that facilitate your care then. So I probably don't have to convince you that healthcare in the United States is extremely expensive. Um, uh, we're uh, right up here at number three at the highest per capita uh, per, uh, uh, per patient. Um, we're also uh, the highest in total spending. And unfortunately, um, quality and cost don't necessarily correlate. So uh, this is a graph done by um, uh, Dartmouth. And you can see that uh, there's wild variations between cost and between quality. So this is Ohio down here, sort of um, midway on cost, but a little bit lower on quality. New York's up here. Um, so I think there might be a little bit of bias because New Hampshire's way up here on both the quality and the cost side. But uh, the Dartmouth Atlas is really a good source for understanding uh, how, we're, how we're spending. 
Um, and, you know, we don't have the best life expectancy either. Even though we spend more than everybody ahead of us, we're still uh, towards the middle for uh, life expectancy. So um, the way we define value in healthcare is uh, quality over cost. So, you know, it's not always doing the, most, the least expensive care that leads to value, but it has to be proportional to the quality. So why do we focus on hip fractures? Well, hip fractures are pretty expensive. It's the 18th most expensive diagnosis in the U.S. It's at over $5 billion now, and there's uh, over 300,000 hip fractures a year in the U.S. The other thing that's kind of interesting or easy about hip fractures is they're very easy to identify. You know, nearly 100% of patients that have a hip fracture need surgery. Nearly 100% get admitted to the hospital. Um, so we see them, they're easy to identify, so they're a good target to study if you're thinking about quality and process uh, improvements. In Rochester, we hit about 1,000 hip fractures per year. Um, so you guys are about four times our size, so you can expect that there's about 4,000 hip fractures a year in your community. So I'm going to go through the five principles of the Geriatric Fracture Center. The first one is most patients benefit from surgical stabilization of their fractures. Um, fractures bleed. You know, you think of a bone as something pretty hard, but it's actually a very vascular structure. When somebody breaks their hip, they bleed into that fracture, and that's actually a big deal. And the longer we let them bleed, the worse things happen. And, of course, there's the functional impairment. People cannot stand or, um, or uh, be mobile on a fracture, and, of course, there's the pain. Um, so, by the way, this is when somebody says, I've got, uh, got a pin in my hip. This is a, what we call a sliding hip screw or... This part's the pin, and this is a, a side plate. Um, this is uh, when they talk about getting a nail. So this is an intermedullary device, or uh, IM nail. Um, when we go to fix the fracture, we want to make sure that we have the correct surgical technique, the right implant, the right surgeon. The thing that's often been neglected is having the right system of care. Um, these patients, while they're fairly routine, are not simple, and even if this part of the procedure is simple. It's kind of like operating on a, um, on a light bulb, and then on top of that, you have all the medical comorbidities and frailty that tend to keep company with fractures. So that brings us to the second principle, which is the sooner patients have surgery, the less time they have to develop iatrogenic illness. Um, I think most of you probably uh, understand that an older adult sitting around a hospital is, is really a formula for bad things to happen. This, as long as they need to be here, they should be here, but we should get them out and get their care done as quickly as possible. So we know that delays lead to delirium. They lead to skin breakdown, infections, malnutrition, urinary tract infections. Sitting around in bed is a setup for thromboembolic disease, and patients decondition. In fact, they decondition for every day an older adult spends in the hospital. It's about three days to get back to baseline. Um, the other thing that happens when people sit around the hospital is they tend to have other falls, which means other injuries and sometimes other fractures. It's not satisfying for anybody for a patient to be sitting around the hospital, and um, you know, cost in the U.S. is very closely correlated to length of stay, and um, the longer patients are in the hospital, the more likely they are to actually die in the hospital. So what we like to say is no good comes from unnecessary delays. So that doesn't mean we shouldn't delay surgery for medical things that we actually need to fix, but you have to make those distinctions between what you can do something about and what you can't. And that brings us to the third principle, which is co-management with frequent communication avoids iatrogenesis. Um, iatrogenesis is not a word. I did manage to sneak it into the literature, and it's in uh, several of our papers. It kind of irks my orthopedic colleague that founded the program with me, so please start to use it. Maybe it will actually become part of the language. Um, so uh, co-management with frequent communication avoids iatrogenesis. So our brand of co-management is very important to understand. Um, in our model, there's shared ownership, which also means that there's shared decision-making, which isn't necessarily a native technique for orthopedic surgeons. It's very much native to geriatricians, um, but not necessarily for orthopedic surgeons. So it's very important as you develop a co-management program to understand that and respect those differences. So in our model, they're seen daily by both orthopedic surgeons and by medicine. In our case, we have the luxury that 100% of our patients are seen by geriatricians. Um, there's daily communication. Now, in the beginning of the program, the daily communication was planned rounds on the unit. Now, um, almost 15 years into the program, where we have a mature program where everybody sort of just goes with the flow and understands how the program works, 
most of the communication is by text messages or phone calls or pagers or sometimes in the, in the chart. But somehow, some way, we're coordinating care every single day. The other thing that's really important is there's equal responsibility. And um, that also is a hard concept because if a geriatrician gets called with a wound issue or an orthopedic surgeon gets called with a diabetes issue, you don't really necessarily want them taking care of it. Um, but the right answer isn't to put somebody else in the middle and say to the nurse, well, you know, why don't you call orthopedics? Typically what we do in that situation is uh, if we can address it, we do. If we can't, we call the other service, let the other service know what the issue is, and we agree who's going to follow up. So I might be calling the orthopedics PA, talking about the wound issue, and tell, tell him or her what I think we should do, but they may actually be the one that writes the orders or calls back to nurses and lets them know what to do. The other thing that's really critical to co-management is each service writes their own orders. Every study where the consulting service doesn't write their orders results in no actual change in quality. It's really kind of fascinating. You can look across just about any medicine consult service where you don't write the orders yourself, the improvements are much smaller um, in comparison to where the service writes their own orders. <coughs> so, Co-management means a collegial environment. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I love my job. I love going to work. I love working with patients. I love working with my colleagues. Um, so it should be a collegial environment. It should be a collaborative environment. At the end of the day, we all have the same goal, which is the best outcome for that patient that has come to our hospital for care. Mutual respect. Um, everybody I know who works at our hospital is well-meaning, smart, hardworking, and is generally there for the right reasons. If that's true, then we should really respect each other. And when there's differences, we should understand why there's differences and make the problem the problem and not the individuals. Because the vast majority of the time, the individuals are not the problem. Every now and then, the individuals are the problem, but a good culture will tend to push those folks along and move them out of the system anyway. Shared decision making, we talked a little bit about. Um, that's a really important concept, and shared decision making is becoming more and more the standard for how we work with patients as well. And in geriatrics, it's critical to do shared decision making, not just amongst the team members, but with the patient and the family. The patient and the family is, a, is as much a part of the team as the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, the nurse, or the geriatrician. And um, they really need to understand what we're doing, and, they need, and we need to understand why we're doing it. Their values and what they hope to get out of their interaction with us is critical to knowing what the best care is. Coordination we've talked about. I'm going to spend a little bit more time also talking about what I mean by true interdisciplinary care. So every Joint Commission certified hospital, every certified hospital in the U.S. has multidisciplinary care. And what I mean by that is they have all the right services, they're all present, they're all able to do their job, um, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily integrated or coordinated or collaborative. With true interdisciplinary care, which is really the hallmark of both geriatrics and palliative care, not only are all appropriate services there, but they're integrated, they're co uh, cooperative and collaborative. Part of that means sharing a vision. So you have to kind of know up front what are the markers of success? What, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? Done correctly, um, it's a case where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts that everybody's got their piece of the puzzle, the puzzle comes together, and uh, the patient has a smooth, positive outcome. And that brings us to the fourth principle, which is standard protocols decrease unwarranted variability. Um, anybody know what this is? It's a ray, and actually it's a, it's a manta ray. And uh, this guy is about uh, 18 feet from wingtip to wingtip. He's enormous, um, weighs thousands of pounds. Not a single bone in his body. He doesn't have to worry about fragility fractures at all. Um, but the reason I bring this up, and I actually took this picture when I was in Thailand, is I'm a diver. And in diving, what we say is plan your dive and dive your plan. People think of scuba diving as an inherently dangerous sport. But the reason it's dangerous is because you haven't anticipated the eventualities and the various things that might happen and have a way to deal with them. So you have to plan your dive and dive your plan to be a safe diver. And since I dive with my daughter, that's absolutely required or I'm not allowed to come home. So in terms of operating, plan your operation and operate your plan. Now this applies to the medical aspects of a surgery as well. Understand what it is that you want to accomplish, know how you're going to do it, and then follow your guide. That doesn't mean that you don't vary when it's appropriate, but you want to vary appropriately. And we'll talk a bit about that in a little bit. 
So our protocols are co-developed. What that means is every service that touched the patient that has an order or protocol that's associated with their care had input. So it didn't mean that every, you know, somewhere, she, some places you just have to compromise, um, but everybody felt ownership for the order sets that we came up with. Where there's evidence, we went with the evidence base. Um, that's usually the best strategy that usually gets people to stop fighting. Um, truly interdisciplinary, again, everything discussed and agreed upon, um, and including when we had to agree to disagree. Um, we also made sure that our order sets matched up nicely with the uh, nursing care plan so that there wasn't conflict and it was easy for the nurses to work with us. And we included a standardized geriatric assessment. We made some compromises where we had to, and um, I wouldn't say our order sets are perfect, but they're thoughtful. And the plan is we measure our outcomes and adjust our plans based on whether we're achieving the outcomes or not. So um, what I like to say is um, unwarranted variability is inappropriate creativity. By having order sets and having protocols, you keep people from shooting from the hip. So I, you know, I've been a house officer myself. When you call somebody at 2 o'clock in the morning, it's far better if they have a standard to go by than um, if they just have to guess. So, for instance, on our order sets, we have low-dose haloperidol. It's not really that I want my geriatric patients getting low-dose haloperidol in the middle of the night. I'd rather they get a careful assessment and see if there's something reversible and all that good stuff for delirium. But at 2 o'clock in the morning, a busy house officer isn't necessarily going to have the luxury to do all that and think about it. By having low-dose haloperidol on the order sheet, it stops them from giving diazepam or high-dose haloperidol and having me come in in the morning and see a patient that uh, has been inappropriately treated and now can't participate with their uh, rehabilitative therapy. Okay, and then our fifth principle. So the fifth principle is discharge planning begins at admission. Um, any of you who might be familiar with the acute care for elders literature will recognize I stole this. Um, so this I took blatantly from the principles of the acute care for elders unit. Um, fortunately, uh, less than 2% of our patients pass away in any given year, so 98% of our patients get discharged. 92% of them go to uh, skilled rehab, and um, so since we know they're going to be discharged, we might as well start the plan right from the very beginning. One of the important things we do uh, as geriatricians is a functional assessment. It's really important to know what was the patient's baseline function at and where are they going. Patients can look really sick in the emergency department who have very different pre-morbid functional statuses and have very different likelihoods of, uh, of uh, improving. Uh, the example I always like to give is um, a 65-year-old burnt-out multiple sclerosis patient from a nursing home may have exactly the same fracture pattern as a 90-year-old <laughs> golfer who tripped getting off their golf cart. Those two people could have exactly the same fracture, but their functional outcomes will be quite different and actually the surgery that they need and the medical management they need may be different, and that depends on a functional assessment. How they look and what their age is doesn't have anything to do with that, really. Um, in terms of the discharge planning, it's really important that everybody's coordinating. Um, patient, family, social worker, physiotherapist, discharge planners, utilization folks, medical providers, and it's also really good if you have a good relationship with your rehab centers and you can coordinate care with them as well. One thing that really destroys the patient experience is when there's inconsistencies in the communication. So if the medicine doc is saying, well, you'll probably be ready for discharge in four or five days, and the physical therapist says, well, you know, I'm not sure, and then the orthopedic surgeon is saying, well, you know, usually people go home three days after we do surgery, that sort of variability confuses patients and it sort of gets, um, creates some distrust, and so it's really important for everybody to coordinate and be consistent. At our center, it's really straightforward. We pretty much say most of our patients get discharged the third day after surgery. So if we operate on them on, on day zero, they'll tend to leave on day three. If we operate on day one, they tend to leave on day four. We try to operate on everybody in under 24 hours. The consistency we talked about involving the family. Um, we, uh, we live in a very competitive environment for both hospital beds and nursing homes. So my sister hospital runs at 110% occupied almost every day. When I started this program, our hospital was only running at about 50% occupied. Um, this morning we were at uh, 285, and my hospital is 261 beds. So we've been very successful at rehabilitating our hospital, but it's created the problem of we really need to get patients out of the beds so new patients can come in as soon as it's appropriate. 
that means having a really good system of care in place, and it means having a really good relationship with the rehab center since 92% of our patients go uh, out to rehab. Um, and so by standardizing the summary, standardizing the discharge instructions, reconciling the medications, and making sure that there's good communication to the rehab centers, they like to take our patients. Our rehab centers are typically in the high 90s in terms of their occupancy. So there's competition for hospital beds and there's competition for rehab beds. All right, so those are our five principles of the geriatric fracture center. So how did we get there? Um, oh, I just uh, wanted to go through this. So this, uh, don't read through all of this, but what I wanted to show you here is that we divide up the labor in terms of what are the common issues we have to deal with and who deals with them. So for instance, in our center, 100% of the patients get admitted to orthopedics. It's a historic, I know centers that 100% get admitted to medicine. There's really no magic to that. Um, as long as the patients are truly co-managed, which service they're on in the computer doesn't make any difference at all. Um, but somebody has to write the admission order. So for our system, it ha it's orthopedics, and that has to do with how our resources are allocated and some other decisions that were made. Um, discharge details have to be shared. Medicine mostly does the um, medication reconciliation, and ortho does the weight-bearing status and the wound care. Uh, DVT prophylaxis, that is often shared. Ortho is primarily responsible, but if the patient was on anticoagulation coming in, we have to figure out what anticoagulation we're going to do going out. Um, and so on. But by having clear rules of engagement, it really helps prevent fights and it makes things go smoothly. Remember, if we get into a fight, the only one that loses is the patient, right? Well, actually everybody loses, but the per one who loses the most is the patient. So the Geriatric Fracture Center got its roots in 1995 when my friend Steve Case was recruited as an orthopedic surgeon to Highland Hospital. Steve um, really felt that nursing home patients were neglected. He's a very unusual orthopedic surgeon in that he was very sensitive to these issues at a time where people really weren't talking about him very much. But he recognized that the surgeries weren't necessarily easy and the outcomes weren't necessarily good. And um, he started thinking about ways to improve care back in 1995. In 98, my boss, uh, Bob McCann, who's a geriatrician, was recruited as the chief of medicine. And um, it turns out that Bob and Steve were very good friends before they both ended up at Highland. And then in 99, I was recruited to start the Acute Care for Elders unit, and we also founded this group, UR Medicine Geriatrics Group, which is um, a nursing home, assisted living, independent living practice that gives us a lot of geriatric patients. That, um, hospital, that large group has us as their primary hospital. So in 2003, uh, Dr. Cates came to me and he said, you know, um, I noticed that when you and I take care of a patient together, it goes much more smoothly and if I have to work with any other medicine doc, how do you feel about working with other orthopedic surgeons? So I said, you know, Steve, to be honest, it's like pulling teeth. And so there is a difference between when you and I work together. Um, he said, well, wh why is that? Why is there a Daniel and Steve standard of care and an everybody else standard of care? Shouldn't there just be one standard of care and shouldn't it be a good standard of care? And, you know, it was really hard to argue with that. So uh, Bob, and, uh, Bob sort of gave us the license to go ahead and do it. So in 2004, we opened after going through many, many steps to formalize what we were going to do and make sure that we had buy-in. So um, the program is for all fractures in patients over the age of 60 or all long bone fractures. Um, the reason we did 60 instead of 65, which is the typical geriatric cutoff, is when we looked at our data, the patients between 60 and 65, while there weren't that many of them, they looked exactly like the patients over age 65. On the other hand, the patients under 60 looked very different and they weren't the same patients. So that's why our program starts at 60. Very specifically, we're low energy. The high energy trauma goes to our level one trauma center, our sister hospital that's a mile away. Um, so we're talking about falls from a standing height, mostly long bone fractures. We do see some pelvic fractures. Mostly we see the non-operative pelvic fractures. The operative pelvic fractures really fall in the high energy category and should end up at uh, the trauma center. Um, everybody's co-managed. We use our patient-centered protocol-driven care model, and it's a total quality management, and we use lean business model to actually design the program. So what is lean business model? Um, anybody, uh, do you guys participate in Six Sigma? Yeah, right, so it, people understand the term lean? Yeah, when I first started doing this uh, lecture, um, nobody knew what lean is. So let's talk a little bit about uh, lean. Um, so there's three essential business models that have had their own place in history. First was craft production, next was mass production, and then lean production. 
craft production is um, really what happened um, uh, before uh, uh, before Ford. It's wide variability in outcomes. It's very specific to the professional doing the service or the craftsman doing doing the, the craft. It tends to be higher cost, worse quality, although sometimes the perceived value is better. So for instance, if you take a Rolex watch, which is a craftsman produced item, it can it's very expensive, but it can't keep as good time as my three hundred dollar Apple Watch, right? No no way and it can't do nearly as much. But obviously one is perceived as much more valuable. Um, craft production usually means poor supply chain utilization, it's the worst use of space, it tends not to be a systematic approach, and customer satisfaction is variable. If you get a good one, you're happy. If you don't, you're not. Mass production it really started with Henry Ford. It's high volume, which moderates the cost. You have scale in terms of uh, buying uh, uh, materials and labor. It's systematic. Unfortunately, still it's often inefficient use of space, inefficient use of supply chain, and still there's moderate quality issues. When Ford first started his production line, half of the Model Ts did not start when they came off the line. So craftsmen, basically mechanics, had to go back after the fact, re-engineer the cars. Some of those cars never, ever worked well, and if you happened to get one of those, you felt like you had a lemon and were taken advantage of. On the other hand, if you got one of the ones that started right off the bat, you might be pretty, pretty satisfied. Margins are generally good with mass production. So that brings us to lean production. So lean production was really started by Edward Deming, who's an American. Um, he didn't get much traction in the U.S., and around the end of World War II, he went to Japan and worked with uh, uh, Toyota and Ono, who started, uh, I think he's uh, Toyota and he's Datsun, um, now Nissan. And uh, he did get traction there in terms of his model. So his model is high volume, Efficient supply chain. What we mean by efficient supply chain is materials get where they're supposed to get just as you need them. So you're not inventorying or holding on to materials that you don't need. Um, and so that means you also have a better use of space because you don't have to warehouse a whole bunch of stuff and you don't have to store stuff around your production site. Um, it's best quality, best margins, and best customer satisfaction. So where are we with medicine? Well, I would argue with medicine, we're still very much in craft production mode. Most of us, if we were seeking health care, we would ask who is the best doctor or the best surgeon or the best um, person. But we don't often ask, well, who's got the best system? Who has the right system of care? And a good system of care can make average providers raise the, raise the, uh, the bottom. Um, so we have high cost care with many readmissions, intermittent lapses in quality, and again, as we talked about, often the results are, are physician specific. So how do you get to lean? Well, first of all, you have to recognize there's a problem and decide that you want to do something about it. Um, you have to measure something and know what it is that you want to fix. Um, so you have to study what you're doing at frequent intervals. You have to study all parts of how do you get to the end result, and you have to measure and record what you do, and the supporting services all have to come together. It's really constructing a shared vision amongst everybody who's involved in the care of the patient and deciding that we're going to go for the best outcomes and deciding what those best outcomes are. So uh, for the Geriatric Fracture Center, we went about this by coming up with this quality improvement database. The quality improvement database was very important for us to understand what we were doing and how we were going to get to where we wanted to get to next. And it has all of these various things in it including hospital-specific parameters like length of stay, but also complications and um, uh, how sick the patients were. So uh, what are our results? So um, this is from one of our very first studies, and uh, you can see that the Geriatric Fracture Center population is older than the national average. Um, it's about the same in terms of male to female. It's a very Caucasian population. Um, very interesting, only 39% of our patients come from their own home. About 40% or 35% come from nursing home. The rest come from assisted and independent living. A lot of studies would just, lift, would just lump assisted and independent living patients with community, but I think it's important for, for us, it was important to make a distinction. Um, the usual care model, only about 20% come from institutions. Charleston score, 3.4. These are very sick patients. The Medicare database, about 2.6. And um, also our patient population has a high dementia, high level of dementia. More than half of our patients are demented. Now this is because we have this huge referral base, the UR Medicine Geriatrics Group, where we get a lot of nursing home patients, assisted living patients, and independent living patients. 
So it makes sense that our patients are older, sicker, frailer, and have more dementia. So you would think that's a perfect setup for worse outcomes, right? Because everything about them is harder. Well, um, compared to other co-managed programs that preceded us, um, our time to surgery was about the same or a little bit better at 24 hours. Um, percent done within 48 hours, which has really become the gold standard, is 93%. We really would love to hit 100%, but that's probably an impossible target. Our overall complication rate's really quite low, about 30%, and the delirium rate only 24.1. Um, about 30% of fracture patients come in with delirium to begin with, so having a new incidence at only 24% is pretty impressive. Um, pretty low infection rate. I'm very proud of the fact that we didn't use restraints at all. It was one of the things that I specifically wanted to measure because I knew restraint use at our sister hospital was, was pretty high. And our length of stay was very good. A 4.6 length of stay down from the mid-fives is um, a huge difference in margin, especially when you do about 500 cases a year. The in-hospital mortality was quite low and the readmission rate was low. So we're very proud of that too because um, at the end of the day, if you're getting people out earlier but you're getting more readmissions, you're not doing a good job. Um, and in fact, when we sent in our first paper, that was sort of a complaint that we got was how do you know, and then we actually reanalyzed the data and got that back out. Um, so again, time to surgery, pretty good. Restraint use, no. Length of stay, quite good. In hospital mortality, 30-day readmission and complication rates, all good. And this is compared to usual care. Um, I can say this because it's many, many years later and I've now set up a geriatric fracture center. This was our sister hospital. Now our sister hospital is almost the same data as we are, but it took them over a decade to uh, adopt our model. They actually just got certified by the uh, Joint Commission um, in uh, hip fracture care and I'm very, very proud of that. Um, mortality. So I knew that we would reduce in-hospital mortality and I was pretty sure we would reduce 30-day mortality. I didn't think we would affect one-year mortality because the patients are old and sick and frail, um, but it turned out even at a year we dramatically reduced mortality. Um, and as you might expect, we had the biggest, uh, um, the highest mortality was in the nursing home patients, worst functional status. Next was the assisted living patients, a little bit better functional status. And then the community dwellers had the best uh, one-year mortality, which is what we—it's what you'd hope for. Um, compared to other programs, again, uh, we pretty much are better. Um, this was a specific study on readmission that we did. Even with 50% of the patients being demented and a Charleston score of 3.1, and a high percentage, uh, this one a little bit higher percentage were from the community. Um, we were able to really get um, a much reduced. Uh, Readmission rate, let's see. Yeah, the readmission rate was only 11.9. Um, Park mobility score is a mobility score that we use. It's kind of an old standard, but it's very heavy in the literature, so we still use it. Um, but uh, functional status or mobility score is actually one of the higher predictors of both mortality as well as readmission. Um, again, just more on uh, readmission data. In this study, we were about 11.9 in comparison to all other groups, uh, we did better. Um, again, just uh, compared to Medicare database, better. Compared to New York State, better. Um, so, this must be a fantastically expensive program because it's got all these great outcomes. Well, it turns out that because length of stay is shorter, utilization of ancillary services is less, and patients, because we capture all the comorbidities, patients actually score higher DRGs. So the revenue is a little bit higher, the costs are much lower, and overall there's a substantial cost savings. Our overall margin per case right now is about 3,500. When we started, it was around 500. Um, and uh, New York, where we are, New York in general is a high Medicare state, but uh, Rochester is actually one of those uh, small markets and uh, our Medicare base is quite low. I think our Medicare base and Cleveland's Medicare base are very, very similar. Um, but again, uh, about two-thirds of the cost of the rest of the nation in New York. Okay, so we figured out this thing that's better than sliced bread. We should probably share it. Um, the John A. Hartford Foundation uh, supported a project from the American Geriatric Society. The American Geriatric Society was the convener. Um, uh, Merganka's parent, uh, 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 came from Brown, 
And Brown actually took our literature, reproduced it, and, and not only reproduced it, but expanded it from fractures to trauma, from trauma to neurosurgery, from neurosurgery to urology, um, to colorectal surgery. I think they're up to eight co-management programs now. And so um, Brown and Rochester collaborated with Hartford and American Geriatric Society to come up with AGS co-care ortho. We recognize that um, most places are not going to have as many geriatricians as we do. Um, so we developed this model where we could actually teach hospitalists and other co-managers how to do what the geriatricians do and uh, how to reproduce this model of care. So that's American Geriatric Society co-care ortho. Um, yeah. So I hope I've convinced you that um, we've figured out the uh, value formula by improving quality and decreasing cost. We have lower morbidity, lower mortality, lower cost, lower length of stay, better bed utilization, which is a huge thing for our system, and lower readmissions. So better quality, better cost, better patient experience, better provider experience. Um, I think we often forget that uh, there's a lot of burnout in medicine these days and having high value programs that are easier for the doctors and the other medical providers to operate and improve their experience. Um, key points from today, co-management improves patient-specific outcomes. Interdisciplinary care is the key to co-management. Lean processes support developing a co-management program. And geriatric uh, co-management is a value-added program. So we went through that pretty fast. We got through uh, a little faster than uh, I expected, but uh, we covered a lot. Um, and I think we have plenty of time for questions. Keith Dermich, I'll have a moderate question. Um, one of the things that struck me was that orthopedics admits all your patients. And we, we've gone through the whole process of orthopedics here about criteria. And one of them is age. I don't know if anybody knows the exact 75. So yeah. we admit everybody over 75 to medicine. And I wonder, when you look at other programs, other hospitals, do you think it makes a difference? Nope, not at all. Yeah. So there's three models that we have seen that I have helped with. Yeah. One is medicine admits 100%, yeah. one is ortho admits 100%, and third is using a formula. Yeah. So my hospital, 100% ortho, my sister hospital, who's having a really good outcomes now, uh, they split, and I think their cutoff is 75 also. Um, the way to decide, so the way we decided back in 2004 was the way we do most things, which was just practical. Back then, a consult paid 50 bucks more than a high-level admission. So for every patient, we were leaving 50 bucks on the table. 50 times 500 is $25,000. That's, that's important. Um, so we didn't want to leave the money on the table. The other thing is, at that time, all of my geriatricians were employed and only about a quarter of my orthopedic surgeons were employed. So I knew that the geriatricians wouldn't abandon the patient and they would follow the rules. Um, Steve and I were a little anxious about whether the private orthos would play the game or not. Um, so it turned out we made the right decision. Part of that formula and the success was when ortho called, we always answered. And when one of my guys didn't play nice, I fixed it. So I had a Friday night where uh, one of my surgeons wanted to operate. So it was 4 o'clock uh, on a Friday. They called the geriatrician who was on call. The geriatrician said, can I just see the patient tomorrow? And the surgeon's like, well, I, I have OR time tonight. Can you, can you see? And so he hemmed and hawed, and, well, I'll get around to it. Um, orthopedic surgeon called me. I went and saw the patient myself. Next day, my colleague was really embarrassed. But you know what? Every time he's gotten called since, he's taken care of the patients. And it's, it's really easy. You know, what care would you want for your mom? There shouldn't be a different standard of care than what your mom would get. That's what my example of suggest. I know when in the past, and I've been involved with this for many years, in the past, if, if one time we didn't respond quickly, that was highlighted, you know, so we always respond quickly. I mean, knackers and dackers heard that, you know. <laughs> So I was going to comment on the same thing. Daniel, we're, we weren't ready to go to an all ortho admission process here. So we set four criteria, some of which have been evaluated in the literature. Yep. One of the things that we thought we were common sense, we are tracking this carefully with our chiefs. And in terms of the decision making, many of the parameters that you're looking at, like to say, uh, ICU admissions, mortality, yep. out of time of surgery, et cetera. And we published that in the public's 
Great. I think ultimately the comfort level between the two services stands. Well, the truth is, if it's fully co-managed, it absolutely doesn't matter whose name is on the chart first. Um, and the, the last point is, you know, we're forever being asked, how do you really rationalize having geriatrics in academic medicine? And I think co-management, in my view, absolutely. is the way to go. Because the ability to interact with all the other, especially surgical services, really is value added. Well, and when you think about it, um, a wonderful medical center like Cleveland Medical Center University Hospitals has advantages that, you know, 90% or 95% of the rest of the country doesn't have. And that's part of what we were thinking when we came up with the uh, AGS co-care model was, um, you know, there's less than 7,000 geriatricians in the U.S. Less than a third of us care about hospital medicine. Even a smaller percentage are really expert at perioperative geriatrics. Um, and there's over uh, 5,000 hospitals that do hip fractures. So there's not even one geriatrician per hospital that does hip fractures. If we really want to make a difference, you have to figure out how to translate those principles so that almost anybody can do it. Um, there's 55,000 hospitals in America. So uh, I very specifically did our educational curriculum with the needs of a, of a hospitalist um, uh, uh, at the forefront. And uh, also recognize that, uh, you know, 80% of the care is in non-academic medical centers, so you have to reach those folks to make a difference. Do you involve trainees or fellows or residents in the, is it a required rotation? Yep. Um, so it's really cool. Uh, two years ago, the director of the uh, orthopedic residency decided that all of his interns would rotate for two weeks with us. Um, in, he didn't even require that they specifically work on the fracture center. What he wanted them to do was to understand collaborative care and um, good medical management. Not because he expects them to be able to do the work, but ultimately you got to know what you don't know, and it's good to have respect for the other services. And it's been brilliant for both. It's improved our geriatricians and it's improved our orthopedic surgeons. Um, plus we have medicine residents and med peds residents and family medicine residents and actually physical medicine residents. Uniformly, our geriatricians are considered some of the best teachers at our hospital, so everybody's looking to, to get some time with us. Awesome. That's fantastic. Yep. Please? Yeah. I think there's about in the and there are all your patients able to be comforted by one or on the Yeah. How do you make sure that the nurse patient has physical therapy and patient work? Sure. So, um, a couple of things. So, there's, a, there's about three units where our patients typically go. Um, the joint commission, in order to certify, you really expect that the same standard of care happens wherever the patients get their care. So all the floors that might get a patient are in service, and then we have a resource nurse from the primary unit that's always available to help if um, somebody doesn't know what needs to go on. In terms of the physical therapists, they're all trained for this patient population because they rotate. Um, uh, so that's, that's kind of a big part of it. The other thing is um, when I started the ACE unit at Highland Hospital, I sort of I had an evil plan. Um, <laughs> I didn't understand why old people should only get good care on one unit. Um, so I worked to geriatricize the hospital. So we still sort of have an ACE unit, but really what we have is a geriatricized hospital. Our older patients get really good care on every unit. The specific protocols to the fracture center, primarily on three units. And when the joint commission, when I know we're in the joint commission window, I fight really hard to uh, get my patients in primary floor. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. In view of the fact that you've got over 300,000 fractures a year, what is being done to educate the elderly in terms of prevention of this sort of problem? Yeah, so that's a wonderful question. So the question was, what are we doing um, for prevention? Um, so there's primary prevention and then there's secondary. Secondary prevention in the U.S. is horrible. Less than 25% of patients that have an osteoporotic fracture actually get treated for osteoporosis. We fight that by what we do in our standard order sets and the assessment that we do at the hospital um, and uh, with our discharge instructions. In terms of primary prevention, um, the Centers for Disease Control, the American Geriatric Society, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, um, AHQR, there's many, many entities working on it. I think we're doing a terrible job. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that one. I wish I did.
Um, but there, there's lots of folks that are interested in primary prevention. Dr. Sittigam, I thought you might comment. She's our perioperative yeah. medicine specialist in, in hospital medicine. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions, Dr. Medicine. For the geriatric factor center, what are your thoughts about evaluating geriatric patients who've had even one fall in the six months for a full geriatric assessment in the geriatric factor center in the office to try to prevent um, future falls? Uh, that's my first question. And the second question is, uh, with the American College of Surgeons coming up with a new geriatric certification investigation program, I uh, wonder what your thoughts are on institutions trying to, trying to get in uh, Yeah, really good questions. So, um, so the Fracture Center, by its nature, um, we mostly deal with secondary prevention. All of our patients are supposed to get a, uh, they get a nursing falls assessment in the hospital, and they get recommendations for uh, additional falls prevention at rehab, but primarily we're passing it off to the rehabs, which uh, I, I think need to do um, a better job at, at that part of it. In terms of, in a health system, identifying those patients that had one fall in six months or three falls in a year, those are your high-risk patients. The best health systems, like Kaiser is able to do this in Southern California, can identify those folks. Um, they can be, you know, there's all sorts of things that can be done. It lends itself best to a nurse practitioner or physician assistant model. They tend to be really good at um, those sort of programs, but you do have to have a way to identify them. Remember, the way our health system is set up, it's not necessarily in the hospital's interest to prevent either the first fracture or the second fracture. Once they have the patient, they have an interest in making sure the patient gets really good care. But, um, you know, it's really the society, the insurer, and the patient that have the interest in preventing uh, the first fracture or the second. And that's really where it's got to, it's really where it's got to come from. Yeah. Um, and then with regard to the American College of Surgeons, um, if you look at their standards, they're really impressive. They really, they did not whitewash this. They really very carefully went through it. Um, if it's actually being done the way they intend, you're going to identify patients that are frail and that have falls risk and other risks that have to be identified. Right now, I would say as a society, we're not well prepared to deal with that, and we need to do a lot more training of um, both physicians and advanced practice providers to, to, meet, that, to meet that need. Um, but again, I think that's also, that's also a society issue and to a degree a systems issue. Yeah, our Resident staff of VA urgent care ER, and there's a Jerry Vet program. And the Jerry Vet program is someone come, passes by the ER and it is, it is a, there's a trigger, and we have dedicated nurse, uh, nurse practitioners and others to sort of evaluate. And I think it's, a, I think it's sort of that whole idea of trying to identify and prevent these higher risk patients. I think it's, it's a, and it's a, the, the, the VA model supports these things. Right. Like economic we'll cut this to population health model. Population yeah, health I mean, the, the ROI is there. There's no doubt that if you did better primary and secondary prevention, you, you can afford it. The cost is low. The problem is the will to do it, which I think is getting better. The other problem is workforce. We simply do not have enough people skilled at doing the work that needs to be done. So everything we can do to encourage folks to uh, learn how to do geriatric assessments, to learn how to do falls prevention, to learn how to do medication reconciliation, all, all those other things that lead to, they're not complicated. It's not like buying an MRI or buying a Da Vinci robot. It's really investment in people. And uh, as a society, we just haven't been very good at that. In your cost analysis that you showed the U.S. Look at proportionally what age groups consume most of that. It's in the geriatric population, given their comorbidities and everything else. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And the the other piece of it, if you look at um, if you look at any of the bundled payment models, the big cost for the bundled payment models are always, almost always, the post acute. Um, um, it's almost always post-acute where the costs come in, and when you look at that, it's the oldest, the frailest um, that end up in that high cost, that high cost place. That's also, I got a, you know, I'm a palliative care doc too, so I have to plug that in. That's also where it's really important to have palliative care. Sometimes you see these rapidly escalating costs with actually no benefit to the patient, 
um, because we haven't spent the time to figure out what, what's the patient really want out of us. Okay. If there's no further questions, I want to thank the Goodman Kahane family thank for you. supporting a really fabulous talk, which I, I really enjoyed. I think we did, and we're an inspirational talk, so thank, thank you. you very much.